What is up, Bitcoiners? This is CK here on FedWatch with Ansel. We're sitting here. Bitcoin has now ripped right through 1750. It's right on its way to 1800. I'm feeling bullish. Ansel's feeling bullish, but realistic. We got a lot to talk about here. We have financial hurricane analogies to try to help you understand what is going on in the world. We have Fed talking about CBDC. We're going to be talking about Bitcoin and what all of this means for Bitcoin. Ansel, how's it going, man? Uh, this episode has been inspired by your most recent episode on your other podcast, Bitcoin and Markets. I listened to it. I messaged you right away. I was like, this financial hurricane example is fire. Um, so I guess we've been talking about disinflation, deflation, inflation, what's happening in the world a lot. I think that this analogy really does a good job of, you know, helping, helped me understand and help me characterize it a little bit better. Why don't you jump into, uh, you know, what you're seeing here? Yeah. So I've been on the deflation or in the deflation camp now for a little while. And um, what I was doing on that last episode of Bitcoin and markets is uh, reacting to um, Michael Saylor when on his hedge eye interview and you know, something in, I mean, I agree with Michael Saylor, probably 90%, but it was something that he said about um, inflation and everything. And I went on a tangent about how, no, you, you can explain financial asset inflation, what people call financial asset inflation, um, as a byproduct of deflation. So in, you know, in a natural disaster, in a hurricane, um, prices will go up like price for a generator or bottled water or, you know, food, uh, anything like that, that you need the necessities for life. And um, that's the same kind of thing we see in a financial emergency is these financial assets um, that seem to be like low risk are going to uh, also go up in value as money flees to those assets. So um, I don't know, I, I, maybe we can try to extend the analogy further, but uh, I think it's, it's, yeah, it makes it real simple to understand how certain things can go up, even though on a broader scale, we've been in a financial hurricane for, you know, a decade. Yeah. And I mean, we, we all know folks that, you know, kind of go back and forth with us on this idea of, you know, everything the Fed is doing is actually just like breaking the system more rather than necessarily stimulating growth or inflation. And I think that there's a lot of like definitional things that people kind of go back and forth on. But this story that the Fed can't control this machine that is the dollar economy, and that every time they pull a layer or something around, it just messes things up more. That makes a lot of sense to me. And this idea that we've been in this financial emergency, this financial natural disaster or manipulation disaster, um, if you will, since uh, 20, 2008, I mean, like, that's kind of true. And like, if you think about from a, uh, just from first principles in terms of like uh, asset allocation and making economic decisions and calculations, you know, that is what people have been forced to deal with, right? They, it's not like, you know, what they're dealing with is just like a hurricane of like, you know, all these assets being messed with and manipulated, and they just have no way of evaluating what's going on around them. Uh, so uh, I think the analogy is fantastic. Yeah. And I mean, it doesn't hit a hurricane doesn't hit you all at once. Like you can, I'm living in Florida now. And when I haven't lived through a hurricane yet, but when a hurricane does come and hit Florida, you know, it, it has these long arms that sweep out and will hit the shore early. Um, the, the actual hurricane doesn't, quote unquote, make landfall until the, the eye of the hurricane comes on shore. So I think over the last few years, we've been living through the outer bands of this hurricane. And maybe right now, um, you know, 
we're at all time highs in the markets. Uh, everything seems to be okay if you look at some of the headline numbers and things, but maybe we're just in the eye of the hurricane and uh, the second half is going to be another decade. And how does, like, I, this, these are the things I like to think about because being a Bitcoiner, um, how does Bitcoin, how do you position yourself for that, uh, for the, the next half of the storm? So, I mean, on the flip side, you know, my good friend, Bitcoin Tina, he always like pushes me. He says like, hey, trust me, like they will print, the Fed will print, governments will print, they have no choice. Like that's all they have. They're going to go into more exotic forms of uh, printing, fiscal spending, MMT, it's all coming. Like, what do you make of that pending reality? Because I don't see a world where, you know, there isn't either fake or real, you know, action in the printing direction. Well, I mean, I get that argument and I think that's very possible, but the U.S. won't be first. Um, the U.S. will be last to do that. And we will see other, like we've already seen like the Turkish lira kind of take a nosedive, right? But most other currencies are hanging in there, maybe uh, depreciating, I don't know, 25% against the dollar. But once we see like uh, currencies depreciating uh, 75, 80%, 90%, then uh, we're going to, you know, then we'll be in the next uh, leg of this kind of crisis. So after we go through that, uh, maybe the dollar will inflate, but not until then. The dollar will be the last one standing. And if that's the case, then we have to see everything else collapse around it. And we just don't see that yet. So we have a lot of breathing room um, for the time being. So speaking of, you know, what is going on around Bitcoin and what is going on around the dollar, we've seen a lot of posturing about CBDCs. My personal opinion is that it's all laughable because, I mean, it's just so much talk and here we are, Bitcoin's about to surpass all-time highs and it's already surpassed its all-time high market cap. So, I mean, like, it, it's it's like in the market, in, in action versus talking and planning and contemplating. And it's, I just don't even see that there's a chance. Like real cryptocurrency, r Bitcoin, is just so far ahead. Um, and I just don't see CBDCs catching up at all. Yeah, isn't it interesting that all the CBDC hype was almost catalyzed this Bitcoin thing? You know, nothing is bad for Bitcoin. And if the central bankers want to talk about their digital currency, it's going to make these billionaires uh, start researching, like, what is Bitcoin all about? How come now the central banks are interested in this? Let's look into Bitcoin more, right? And so they kind of, uh, maybe you could say they sparked this whole thing by doubling down on these stupid CBDCs. Yeah, um, that's called the Streisand effect. As the you try to effect, smother yeah. something, as you try to, you know, misdirect to something else, all you actually do is uh, bring more attention to it. Uh, also, so, the the Cobra effect. Have you heard of that one? Yeah, that's a yeah. Explain it, but yeah, I, I've seen some good tw uh, tweet threads on on Twitter. Yeah, so in when India was still under British control, uh, they had a Cobra problem, and so they were going to pay like one coin per Cobra that people turned in because they wanted to get a hold on this uh, Cobra population. And what happened, <laughs> the locals started breeding Cobras. And so they, they had to cancel the, the policy and they had a worse Cobra problem than before. The, you know, they tried to handle it. So that's the Cobra effect. Yep. And I mean, you could take that general um, idea and just apply it to almost everything that the government does that is against or antithetical to the market. Exactly. And we've said for years that as these, you know, in response to governments banning Bitcoin, we're like, well, they would just be admitting that it's strong enough to worry about and that will get people looking into it. So yeah, everything that I think Bitcoiners have been saying for the last eight to 10 years are slowly coming true. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, let's let's hear what the the Fed people are saying and people in the central banks. Yeah. Before you cut to the clip, real quick, Christian, um, this is the European Central Bank Forum on Central Banking, and 
uh, I wanted to play this because Christine Lagarde is in here and Jerome Powell, and they're talking about CBDCs. So once again, we're getting the news directly from the horse's mouth and not having to read the headlines, uh, you know, what people want us to think about CBDCs. Let's jump right into this clip. Several members of the audience are asking how central banks see the prospects for, for central bank digital currencies and also whether this would risk crowding out cash and non-cash electronic uh, payments. Um, let's start with um, Chair Powell. So um, here at the Fed and in the United States, we're committed to carefully and thoughtfully evaluating the potential costs and benefits of a central bank digital currency, which we all call a CBDC, for the U.S. economy, for our payment system, and also for the international uh, uh, implications. We've been actively participating with uh, Andrew and Christine and other central banks at, at the BIS to look at this, and we feel that's been a very productive collaboration. We haven't made a decision to issue a central bank digital currency, and we think there's quite a lot of work yet to be done as we, uh, as we engage with public constituencies here in the United States and around the world um, before making a decision. Also, the dollar is the world's uh, uh, principal reserve currency, and I, I assure you that we will approach that question with, with great care. From our standpoint, uh, the main focus is on, on whether and how uh, a CBDC could improve what is already a safe, effective, and dynamic domestic payment system. We actually do still have strong demand for cash here, which is, I think is different than, uh, than, than some other uh, jurisdictions. So we really would need this to be done in a way that does not preempt the use of cash or the use of other uh, private digital currencies uh, in, or, or, uh, or non-central bank digital currencies, uh, such as the Fed now payment uh, thing that we've, that we've announced. I, the last thing I'll say is, um, you know, we, we feel an obligation to be on the on the frontier of research to, on technology and and uh, policy development on this. But we, as the as the as the main reserve currency, we do feel it's critical that we that we get it right, as opposed to try to be the first. You know, in a way, we're we're the incumbent reserve currency, and so we're going to be very careful and and uh, engage quite extensively on this before we make a decision. Uh, President Lagarde, there's an expectation the ECB will be first. We're not racing to be first. Uh, and uh, we believe that uh, a digital euro will not be a substitute for cash. It will be a, a complement to cash. And clearly it's not, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it's not a nicety, it's not a tantrum. It is something that uh, if it is uh, cheaper, faster, more secure uh, for um, the users, then we should explore it. If it is going to contribute to a better monetary sovereignty, a better autonomy uh, for um, the euro area, uh, <clears throat> I think we should explore it. And uh, you know, if it is going to facilitate cross-border payments, which are very laborious in quite a few corners uh, of uh, our big world, then we should explore it. So that's the reason why we have um, launched a consultation uh, in mid-October that will be completed in mid-January. And at that point in time, we will make the decision as to whether or not we go forward with a digital euro. And uh, my, my hunch, but this is a decision that will be taken collectively, is that we might well go in that direction. So I got opinions on this one. Okay, uh, go. So... Very interesting. It sounds like Europe is gonna is gonna go into this. Like it sounds like she's excited, and uh, even even the moderator indicated that Europe was gonna be the first. Um, everything she's saying though is kind of hilarious though, just because I I don't see how a CBDC would solve a lot of those issues, and they actually even kind of makes me think that when Bitcoin is ready, these governments are going to adopt it real fast um, mm -hmm. because it will solve a lot of problems. Like ultimately getting onto an internet standard is going to solve a lot of problems. And, uh, you know, well, it remains to be seen if, if governments are actually going to fight it or if they're going to just be forced to adapt. Um, and then lastly, kind of going to Jerome Powell, he kind of indicated that 
they're not going to disrupt the dollar. He understands that he's the incumbent. And it kind of shows you that he right now is facing a, the disruptor's dilemma, which is, you know, when or the incumbent's dilemma is when you're the incumbent, you it's very, very difficult for you to disrupt yourself. Yet you are the only one in the position to disrupt yourself and continue to dominate the industry. And if you don't, then uh, a new player, and in my opinion, Bitcoin, you know, comes up and and gobbles up the market uh, from underneath you, from at from the margins uh, where you don't, where you can't uh, serve, and ultimately grows and grows and grows, and uh, and then at some point can can face off against the incumbent head on. Um, that's kind of how startups and other technological areas have seen disruption happen. And uh, listening to him, I just like, yeah, you you are the incumbent, and you are dealing with this dilemma of how do you you know disrupt yourself without breaking what you already have. Yeah, I think that's extremely well put. Um, that's exactly how I view this whole thing is the dollar can't change. You know, it's stuck. It's uh, debt, debt ridden and the entire kind of financial system is entrenched around the dollar. Uh, it actually, the amount of transactions or percentage of transactions that happen in the dollar is going up every year. And so it's just getting more and more entrenched. And so I think that, yeah, that's, that's perfectly put. Now, I don't think that the, the ECB or, or any of these other CBDCs are going to do anything for that. Um, it'll probably end up destroying their own currencies. So we'll see how that all goes. Yeah, I mean, again, when I hear these guys talk, I just think that they're operating in 2015 and Bitcoin's in 2020, you know, and, you know, they're operating on cheap, cheaper, faster, better. And Bitcoin is operating on harder money, more censorship resistance, more permissionless. Like it's going to disrupt them in ways that they, they are just not thinking about whatsoever with these CBDCs. Yeah. I think um, it was great to hear Powell, talk about cash though. I'm the more I hear Powell talk and we've said this in other shows. I mean, he just seems fairly level headed. He's not in a rush uh, to do a CBDC. He's not in a rush to maybe say things that uh, give people false hope maybe. And in this case, he said the right stuff. He's, he wants to uh, protect cash and private digital currencies. Did you hear that, that piece? So he said, protect cash and other private digital currencies. So that is, to me, kind of a, maybe a Freudian slip about Bitcoin that he wants to protect that. And then he got, you know, <laughs> he's, he's the big guy on this panel uh, from the Federal Reserve, and he's making the guard even say, make a concession for cash. that They don't want to get rid of cash. It's going to be a complement to cash. So I don't know, <laughs> how do you do a CBDC and have cash. I mean, it's, it's not lining up here. Um, and, and listening to these people though, it is very, I think it's a very high signal. So you don't have to listen to these other Bitcoin people or gold people talking about, Oh, this one world government conspiracy. They want to bring the CBDC in and, um, the, what was it? The economist cover from 1975 that showed like that Eagle with the one world currency on it. Like yep. that's so I, I, listen to these people get the signal and don't try to read into it uh you know they they even aren't better smarter. listen to fed watch because we're going yeah, to listen to them to and translate it directly for you and don't get caught up in this uh all these i don't want to say the term but conspiracy theories <laughs> well it's always uh good to be open minded to what is beyond the surface but it's never good to make up your mind on something that doesn't have, you know, proper factuality behind it. You know, there's the middle ground. You, you can't commit to falsities. And then on the, on the flip side, you can't, uh, you need to be open-minded that what's on the service is not reality. Uh, it's a difficult, difficult uh, line to, to kind of, you know, balance. Yeah. But all these, these are just people, you know, like Jerome Powell doesn't know anything about CBDCs any more than you or I do. I mean, we're Bitcoin specialists in this space, and uh, a lot of people think that there's some nefarious 
you know, conspiracy behind all these elites trying to do all this stuff and that they put, they make, they give them too much credit. So anyway. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that is part of what underpins the disinflation deflation thesis is, these are just people, these systems are immensely complex and chaotic and uh, they just can't process it all and they're learning on the go and things that they do most likely are not good. Um, but let's let's jump over to Bitcoin. Um, when we first wrote up these show notes like 15 minutes ago, Bitcoin was at <laughs> 17,745 and now it's at 17,604. So Bitcoin is volatile guys, but uh, it seems to be very volatile up to the right. So uh, not too mad about it these days. Yeah, I just want to caution people that d- don't get too, don't don't FOMO in at the top of these things. Um, I mean, obviously you want to be DCAing and buying your Bitcoin and investing in Bitcoin, but uh, don't be surprised with a, a pretty significant retrace along the way. Bitcoin will become more volatile. And that's what I did say in my last uh, podcast too of Bitcoin markets is um, volatility comes in different stages for Bitcoin and we are headed into the time of volatility. Yeah. I would also add that price is almost always earned. I've never seen a price level on Bitcoin that it didn't grind to that confidence to build that price level. Remember 10K, how much it oscillated around there, how much it ground around there. It was painful. So um, I've seen a slice pretty much straight through 13K. So um, anything that comes fast can go pretty quick. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. And we're not at all-time highs yet, but we are at all-time market cap highs. Is that correct? Yes, yes. 17,700 was the number for all-time high market cap. Uh, Bitcoin Magazine is all on top of that. And once again, this is just dollar-centric though. I mean, it's been making all-time highs for the last year in many other currencies, um, which I think is a very important part of this story. We're talking about U.S. uh, entities buying in, U.S. hedge funds, U.S. uh, investment funds or whatever. And uh, it's really a global phenomenon. And all of these other places that their currencies are going down faster than the dollar, you know, they are probably investing faster into Bitcoin as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I've said this before, I think mostly on Twitter, but I, I love this phrase. I don't know how well it translates, but Bitcoin wins at the margins, right? Like Bitcoin doesn't win against areas that are heavily banked and there's incredible, you know, Visa and all this stuff, you know, Bitcoin wins in places where things are breaking down, where there's permission everywhere, where there's censorship and uh, inflation everywhere that's where people turn to Bitcoin and that's where it just always wins. I like that one. That's good. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about Bitcoin. I've, you know, I've learned so much about Bitcoin just from Bitcoin and markets. And you taught me about this idea of a Bevelin good, um, which is uh, a good that is more desired as it gets more expensive, uh, which is unlike most goods. If you think about it, if you would buy a laptop at a thousand bucks, there's a lot less people that would buy that same exact laptop at 2000 bucks, but Bitcoin's different. You know, when Bitcoin was three K and at the bottom of the market, no one wanted to touch it with a 10 foot pole. Now at 17 K arguably a much worse deal. Um, Although I think it's still a pretty good deal. Um, You know, (laughs) Bitcoin is highly desired. Everyone's talking about it. That is what a Bevelin good is. Why don't you kind of like break down this definition and uh, what does it mean for Bitcoin? Well, there's a little bit of controversy over, of what exactly is a Veblen good and is it even a thing? Because really what it is, is um, a backwards sloping demand curve. So as uh, price goes up, demand also goes up, which is just exactly opposite. Now, in most cases, this does happen with luxury goods. So you can talk about Rolexes or, um, you know, really nice cars, Lambos and stuff. They, the demand is higher because they're overpriced, right? And it's, it's a status symbol. Uh, but eventually that demand curve goes back the other way. Um, it, for normal goods, not including Bitcoin, normal goods that would have a backward sloping demand curve eventually go the other way. So you wouldn't, no one would buy like a $5 million Rolex. Demand would never go up, ev- 
you know, a $5 billion Rolex, you know, there would be no demand for that. So um, it, it eventually goes back the other way, but Bitcoin is different. Bitcoin can go have a backward sloping demand curve forever and never stop, which is extremely interesting. Yeah, I mean, that's something that just blows your mind completely. And apologies, I said Veblen good, even though, it, or Veblen good, even though it is Veblen good, V-E-B-L-E-N. So uh, don't mean to confuse the listeners out there. Make sure to listen to Ansel's uh, definitions and go check out the Bitcoin di- dictionary so you can get all of the important definitions in Bitcoin. Um, so, I mean, I guess let's let's kind of reminisce on this a little bit. Let's get cosmic, right? Um, okay. Bitcoin as a the ultimate Veblen good, the Ve- the Veblen mm-hmm. good that has uh, that never kind of inverses. Um, you know, what does that mean, and how how do you how do you deal with tr- selling it? Really, if you understand that that's the reality, and you you know even let's say you have a very comfortable stack of Bitcoin, like how do you go about parting with some of that Bitcoin? Um. Well, it's, it's risk management as well. I, I recently listened to an interview that Simon Dixon did and they asked him if he was, you know, hundred percent Bitcoin. And he said, no, I'm not hundred percent Bitcoin. I have different strategies. So part of my portfolio is allocated to us dollar denominated things. Part of my portfolio is Bitcoin. Uh, part of it is gold. And so I think that is, you just have a higher demand for something else. Like there's always a price for everything, right? And I would be willing to part with a little bit of Bitcoin if the price is right for something else. So it's just a matter of other prices going down enough to entice people to spend their Bitcoin, right? Yep, that's uh, that's kind of exactly right. And um, I mean, what that bodes is prices are gonna be going down a lot against Bitcoin, right? Um, and it kind of reorients the way an economy works. Uh, and just to tease next week's show, we have, we're have we bringing on someone who talks about this a lot. Uh, Jeff Booth, uh, the author of The Price of Tomorrow, uh, famous entrepreneur and now um, investor and mentor. Um, and, you know, one of the most, I would just say, uh, just most helpful and, and, and awesome additions to the Bitcoin community. Uh, so I'm excited to have him on and I'm excited to um, have him kind of break down these ideas a little bit more, a lot of ideas that we've been kind of tiptoeing around. Um, but yeah, I mean, just thinking about what switching to a hard money standard, a finite supply currency standard like Bitcoin does to the world, to prices and how we organize ourselves and communicate value. Uh, it's just hard to just fully wrap your mind around what that does to everyone's actions. Bitcoin changes you more than you change it. Bitcoin is going to change the world. It brings optimism to the world. So um, it, it's one of the things that makes me very uh, optimistic about the future. Uh, I have all my kids and I'm optimistic about their future, even though with all this political stuff, the fourth turning going on right now, I'm very optimistic because Bitcoin exists. Even if I didn't own any I would say, you know, I'm optimistic because Bitcoin is going to make the world a better place for them to live in. I'm excited for that too. And uh, again, excited to kind of hash that out with, uh, with Jeff next week. Um, just on one last note, I think that this is something that, you know, you push a lot with your trying to explanations of disinflation and deflation is that, you know, Bitcoin will be the source of growth. You know, the problem is that they can't force growth anymore. They can't manipulate little, uh, you know, widgets in order and knobs in order to force growth. Um, so uh, Bitcoin, the organic ecosystem, uh, is where growth is going to come. So uh, I think that's an idea that you push, and it's a very optimistic idea. And it's, I think it's a very good way of, you know, kind of pitching Bitcoin. Yeah, one of the things I'm excited to get into with uh, Jeff about is um, misallocation and technology. So like, yes, technology is doubling every 18 months or whatever the case is, but is that misallocated doubling? And how does that play into deflation, inflation? Um, it's, it's a broad topic, so I'm excited to ask a few questions. 
This one's going to be cosmic, guys. Hopefully, we can smash it into 45 minutes. Let's wrap (laughs) this episode up. You guys can find me at CK underscore Snarks. Make sure to go check out at Bitcoin Magazine. We've been putting out some fantastic work there and excited to represent more Bitcoiners there. So if you are a Bitcoiner creating fantastic content or doing some research, make sure to hit me up, hit up Bitcoin Magazine. We would love to see how we can amplify great Bitcoiners. Um, you can find Ansel at Ansel Lindner. Um, make sure to go to Bitcoin and Markets, his other podcast, one of my absolute favorites. Um, and lastly, last plug for the fold card. Go get the fold card at Bitcoin, BlackFriday.com. Get into that raffle for one Bitcoin. Like I, I can't even I don't even know where Bitcoin's gonna be by the time we we pull that that raffle. Uh, I think it's gonna be in two Fridays. So um, could be 20k. That could be an awesome, awesome reward. Thank you.